Hello everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Nitin Pabuwal and I am an engineering manager in the GCP org. Today, I am extremely pleased to welcome Swami Sarvapriyananda to talk at Google. Swami Sarvapriyananda is the minister of the Vedanta Society of New York. He is a monk, a philosopher and a very popular teacher. He teaches Advaita or non-dual Vedanta philosophy and is also well versed in many other philosophies of the world. He was recently granted the Nagral Fellowship at Harvard and has spoken at many large forums, including TEDx, Science and Non-Duality Conference, and many renowned universities and colleges. He is very popular worldwide and also has a large online following on YouTube. As his talks cater well to the scientific intellectual minds and he seamlessly relates ancient wisdom to modern society. Today's talk will explore the core of non-duality, how it is realized, its implications for the quality of our lives, and broader implications for modern consciousness studies. It's a very subtle topic and will need your undivided attention. So please avoid the urge to multitask. There will also be an opportunity to ask questions towards the end through the chat feature on YouTube. So, without further ado, let's welcome Swami Sarva Priyananda. Swami Namaste, Ji. Namaste everybody. You. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, Nitin, and thank you to uh, Google for having me this afternoon. So today we are going to talk about consciousness. Consciousness is everywhere in our lives. You are looking at me. You're listening to my voice. You're aware of uh, sitting in the chair, your environment, light and sound. All of this is possible because you are conscious. There's consciousness when we see and hear and smell and taste and touch. So consciousness is all pervasive. I remember last week, I was listening to this talk by Christoph Koch, the chief scientist of the Paul Allen Brain Institute where he was talking at the uh, Harvard bookstore uh, about his new book, The Feeling of Life Itself. And he said, you know, consciousness is the most important thing in our lives. Um, so he humorously said that if you give me a billion dollars and say you give up your consciousness and you can, you can go on living, you'll still be a living body. You can just be like a zombie. He said, I wouldn't accept a billion dollars. I can't trade my consciousness for anything in the world. And that's how important consciousness is. Uh, today, there is a great interest in consciousness studies fueled by uh, the developments in neuroscience, by the new imaging technology of the brain, uh, by the development of uh, the internet and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, there is a tremendous interest in understanding scientifically what consciousness is, where does it come from, what does it do, what are its possibilities, and so on. But consciousness studies is not a new subject. Consciousness studies is very, very ancient. As the philosopher Evan Thompson has written in his book, Sleeping, Waking, Dreaming, and Being, uh, he says consciousness studies goes all the way back to the Upanishads, these very ancient texts in the Hindu scriptures, the Vedas, these Upanishads contain the final, the highest spiritual and philosophical teachings of the Vedas, dating back, who knows, 5,000 years or more. And they made a remarkable breakthrough in consciousness studies so many centuries, millennia ago. And those uh, insights into consciousness, into human consciousness, uh, were developed into this body of, uh, of a philosophy called Vedanta. And over the centuries, into this philosophy of non-dual Vedanta, which is a school of Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. So that's what I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, afternoon and this Google talk today in the next few minutes. The, these very ancient insights into uh, consciousness, very profound and very, very important. Uh, first of all, for our personal lives and also for what they can do for this mo modern investigation into consciousness. 
The whole purpose, let us remember, of uh, Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta was overcoming human suffering and attainment of lasting, deep fulfillment. We'll see how it, it works. Um, I'll try to present the essence of the teachings of non-dual Vedanta in the next few minutes. I want to flag something here. Though it's deeply rooted in the Hindu traditions, uh, Vedanta is the central philosophy of Hinduism, but there is something unique about non-dual Vedanta. It's not religion as it is generally understood. You know, you have to believe in something, faith in something. Not at all. It's quite the opposite. It's rather understanding something, realizing something, seeing something, let us say. Uh, it is not even about extraordinary mystical experiences with which uh, religion, the mystical side of religion is associated. Rather, and this is important, it is about our daily experience. You know, just this experience which we are having. Everybody has this experience of seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and touching, of waking and dreaming and sleeping. Just our daily lived experience and applying a certain logic to it, a certain philosophical, logical investigation based on experience and reason, we come to this startling insight about ourselves. Vedanta is an investigation into ourselves to find out who or what we are. And the claim that Vedanta makes is that uh, when we truly know what we are, we will discover that we are not these limited beings of flesh and blood, born at a particular time, fated to grow old and diseased and die at some time later. No, uh, this remarkable discovery that we are this immortal consciousness, uh, that is the discovery. And Vedanta claims that we can all come to an understanding of this uh, if we follow our experience uh, guided by the insights of Vedanta. So here is this journey. It's not a journey from not believing to believing in something. It's not a journey from um, our present uh, daily experience to some kind of extraordinary experience. No, rather it's a journey from not knowing to knowing, to realizing, to seeing. Uh, that's what makes it uh, incredible for this day and age. Uh, there is nobody who is rational and scientific who could have any kind of uh, uh, objection the usual objections which are leveled against faith-based approaches. So how do we do this? What is the pr process in Advaita Vedanta? The process is to investigate oneself, our experience of ourselves. Um, there are methodologies developed in Advaita Vedanta which, uh, which help us in this investigation. And I will talk about one of these methods. Uh, this is my favorite, and it's found in a text called the Drig Drishya Viveka, written about 700 years ago by a philosopher in the south of India. Uh, in this text, we are led what is called phenomenologically, you know, in our lived experience, uh, step by step, from the outermost aspects of our experience to a subtler inner aspects of our experience to what consciousness really is. The way it is done is the discernment, the distinction between the seer and the seen. And it starts very simply. Here you are looking at the screen, looking at, at me on your screens. And you become aware. You take your attention from what you are seeing, the forms that, that we are seeing. We take our attention to the eyes, that the eyes are seeing. We just attend to the fact that the eyes by themselves are the seer and they see this world around us. All sorts of colors and shapes, uh, people and things, all of them, such a variety of things which are seen, they are seen by these eyes. And uh, these eyes by themselves, they're distinct from what they are seeing. The seer and the seen are two different things. They are not the same thing. That is an essential insight which we are going to use. So that's the first thing we become aware, something very commonplace. Like any good teacher, Vedanta takes you from what is obvious to what is subtle and not so obvious. So the eyes are distinct from what they see, and the eyes by themselves see all different forms, the changing forms which come before us. Then we go inwards, more subtle. 
we transfer our attention to the eyes themselves and then we become aware that I am aware of my eyes. The mind is aware of the eyes. The thought, the, we are, that, that when my eyes are open, I'm aware that my eyes are open. When my eyes are closed, we are aware that our eyes are closed. When, when we need glasses, we are aware that the eyes need glasses. So the eyes themselves become the, so to say, scene, an object. And the mind is the seer. So now the mind is the seer and the eyes are the object. And the world, of course, is still remains as the object. Now we notice immediately the mind, whatever it is, is clearly distinct from the eyes. The seer and the seen are separate. They are not the same thing. Um, the mind is the observer not only of the eyes, but of the, all the sense organs, the entire sensory system, the skin and the nose and the tongue and the ears. In fact, of the entire body. So the mind is the observer of the body, the seer, and the mind and what it sees or what it observes, what it thinks about, uh, they are distinct because the seer and seen are distinct, different. Now, we can go deeper. The mind itself, our thoughts, our feelings, emotions, ideas that I understand, all of this we are aware of. The movements of the mind are also something that we are aware of. Uh, that I am happy. I'm aware that I'm happy. I know that. Uh, that I am pleased or I remember or I cannot remember. I understand or I do not understand. All these are activities of the mind, the thoughts in the mind. And they become the observed, the seen. And I, whatever I am, I am aware of the mind. So I am the witness, so to say, of the mind. And the mind is something that is seen. Now, if the seer and the seen are distinct, then I, the witness of the mind, whatever I am, I must be distinct from the mind. I am not the mind. I am the witness of the mind. The seer and seen being different, I must not be the same as the mind. I am something that lights up the mind, that illumines the mind, that is conscious, aware of the mind, the various thoughts and feelings in the mind. Now, this is already very interesting because uh, we generally, most of us thinking people, grown up, we generally identify ourselves most closely with our minds. I am this person who thinks, feels, has a personal story, um, likes and dislikes, a memory, a narrative about myself. This person, this mind is who I think I am. And here we are being told, if you are aware of the contents of your mind, that you cannot be the mind. You are that which is aware of the mind, that which is the witness of the mind. This witness, this witness self, it must be consciousness. It must be awareness by the very fact that it lights up the mind. And the mind being lit up by consciousness, this conscious mind is now conscious of the body and the senses. And this conscious mind-body unit is now aware of the external world. So now we have gone from a sense of bodily self to a sense of mental self to a sense of the witness of the mind body. So who am I according to this way of thinking? I am the witness of this body and mind. Being the witness of this body and mind, I must be distinct from this body and mind. I am, what can I say about myself? The one thing I can say about myself is obviously I exist uh, and that I am aware. What am I aware of? I'm aware of the mind. I'm aware of the body. I'm aware of this body-mind. So the question, who am I? What am I? This investigation of the self leads us to this uh, appreciation and sort of intuitive grasp that I must be consciousness, a witness of the mind and the body. This consciousness itself, our immediate... Uh, uh, immediate enthusiastic response to this would be, hey, that's interesting. I would like to know more about this consciousness. What is this like? What am I this consciousness like? That cannot be done. Um, that philosopher who wrote uh, 700 years ago, he says, this conscious self, this pure subject is not an object. You cannot know it. If you know it, then what is the knower? What is the one which is seeing? So it is always the seer, 
I am always the seer, not the seen. I am always awareness, consciousness, not something that I am aware or conscious of. Uh, so the seer is never seen in the words of uh, that philosopher in Drigdrishya Viveka. Since we are trying to understand what consciousness is from the Advaitic perspective, it's very important to pause at this point. This idea that consciousness is not an object. This is a fundamental insight going all the way back to the Upanishads. This is something really I feel that Vedanta can contribute to modern consciousness studies, the modern philosophy of mind. This is not something that is usually understood. So I want to stop here for a moment and appreciate this carefully. Do follow me carefully at this point. It's very subtle. What do I mean that I, consciousness, the witness, am not an object? Then what am I? What exactly, exactly am I talking about? At this point, the old Indian story of um, uh, the tenth man is, is helpful here. What the story says is, ten people, ten friends were going on a journey and they crossed this river on their journey. And after having crossed the river, they uh, think, did we all cross or uh, did somebody drown? Let's count. And one of them counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God, there are only nine people. And this, uh, our, the 10th person is, has drowned. And the others say, no, no, you can't be right. Let me count. And each person who counts, counts only nine people. Obviously, they're not counting themselves. But they think there are only nine people and we started out as 10. So the 10th person has drowned and they sit down and they start crying and weeping and wailing until there's a passerby who sees them and asks, why are you crying, my friends? Oh, sir, what a tragedy. There were 10 of us when we started the journey and now there are only nine of us left. Obviously, one of us drowned and our tenth the 10th person, our friend is dead. He's drowned and we are, we are so sad. This man, he sees all 10 of them are there. So he asks, how do you know that there are only nine? Well, because we counted and uh, we found only nine. This man tells them, relax, it's all right. All 10 of you are there. And they go, where, where's the 10th person? Relax, I'll show you. I'll show you where the 10th person is. One of you count. One of them starts counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I told you so. And this man comes and takes the counter's hand and turns the hand this way and says, Thou art the tenth. You are the tenth. Dashamastuamasi in Sanskrit. You are the tenth. And this man goes, Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Ah, the tenth person has been found. And everyone wants to try it out. And they say, Let, let me try. And they count nine and they turn the hand around and find ten. I am the tenth. And so they are very happy. Now, that might sound like a silly uh, uh, tale, but it's actually very important as far as consciousness studies is concerned, uh, because let's just ask, why did they not find the 10th person? And the immediate answer is, of course, they were not counting themselves. But then a deeper question arises, why were they not counting themselves? Why were they not counting themselves? The simple reason is, because the counter found nine people outside. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And therefore, the tenth person must be outside by that logic. And there's a, it's a good reasoning, actually. I found nine people there. There should be the tenth person right there. But the tenth person isn't there. The tenth person is not an object out there. The tenth person is none other than the one who is counting. Now, this, this story is very important because... Uh, it gives us a clue to what Vedanta means by consciousness. Vedanta means by consciousness something that is in our experience not classifiable, not objectifiable as this. It's not an object. Whatever we are aware of is not consciousness. Whatever we can see or hear or smell or taste or think of or understand or objectify in any way or remember, none of it is consciousness. It's an object shining in consciousness. So consciousness is like the 10th one. When we, when we investigate the world, 
then the body and then the senses and the mind and the thoughts, feelings, awareness. And then that which is aware of all of this. Now that turning of the hand, that intuitive reflexive grasp, it must be done in our own understanding. Uh, it cannot be pointed out. What can be pointed out is not consciousness. In fact, Vedanta offers a very interesting definition, uh, an inside-out definition of consciousness. And this is important because one problem they have had with consciousness studies till today is they're quarreling over definitions. What is consciousness? And every definition of consciousness, for good reasons, involves something objective. But from a Vedantic perspective, this perspective which we have right now, we immediately see where they're going wrong. If you define consciousness in terms of behavior, that's an objective thing. You're mixing up what is not an object with an object. If you define consciousness in terms of um, thoughts, in fact, in terms of uh, neuroscience, you know, says uh, we'll trace it back to the fine activities in the neurons, electrical activities in the neurons. But from a Vedantic perspective, that's still not correct because that's an object too. If you are aware of it through your instruments, then it's an object of your awareness. Even the mind, which is what we always take to be conscious, Vedanta says even that is not consciousness. Because if you are aware of your thoughts, emotions, ideas, conceptions, memories, in fact, all this process we are doing now in Vedanta, all of that is still object. Uh, so Vedanta gives us a very, uh, very precise way of defining consciousness. Consciousness is not this. In Sanskrit, neti neti. Whatever we can be aware of, either directly through our senses or through our minds, our thoughts, or indirectly through our instruments, our scientific instruments, all of it, they are all objects. They are not the tenth man. That which is aware of all of them is consciousness. Uh, it is the pure subject, the non-objective subject. It is uniquely distinct from everything else, uh, as the tenth man is distinct from the other nine. This is something that is not yet understood. Uh, I mean, I was at this uh, course I took at Harvard last year on the philosophy of mind, and we did a survey of all the work that is done on mind and consciousness, um, and everywhere they're getting stuck at this point. They're still trying to make consciousness into something objective, either reduce the mind into, uh, uh, you know, they don't distinguish between mind and consciousness, to reduce it to body or to the brain or to behavior or to language, uh, and try to say that is consciousness. And there'll be this other philosophers coming and pointing out that, no, it doesn't work. Uh, those who have read this, you know, uh, Thomas Nagel's, what is it like to be a bat? or John uh, Searle's uh, The Chinese Room Experiment, or the Turing Test, uh, why it does not prove consciousness, uh, or uh, Jackson's Mary, who uh, did, had never seen color and sees color for the first time. They are all thought experiments to show that all the attempts to reduce consciousness does not, they don't work. There is a problem somewhere or the other. All the attempts to see that the tenth man is nothing other than the nine, you'll never find the tenth man among those nine. So this idea we must accept from Advaita Vedanta that consciousness is uniquely distinct. It's an entirely different category uh, from the objective universe. The universe out there, the objective body, even what is normally taken to be the subject, the mind, that is also an object. And in our experience, that's what we experience all the time. So you can try this for yourself. Here is the world outside. I'm aware of it. Now change your attention to the body, to the eyes maybe. I'm aware of the eyes. Change your attention to the mind, the mind which is aware of the eyes. Thoughts, feelings, emotions. I'm aware of the mind. Push backwards to suppose you drop the mind. Stop. The blankness. There's a blankness. Absence of thought. But I'm aware of that too. That also is an experience. What is it that is aware of the blankness when there is no thought? of the thoughts when there are thoughts, of the body uh, when it is experienced, and through the body, the external world, what is the one thing which is lighting up all our experiences? That is the non-objective consciousness. We, we call it sometimes pure consciousness, but pure not in the sense of it is good or bad. It's just that 
it's not mixed up with any object. Yeah. So that is one thing that Vedanta tells us. Immediately we see the benefits of this. If I am this non-objective pure consciousness distinct from body and mind, experiencing the body and mind, and through the body and mind experiencing an external world, then in a sense I am free of the body and mind. The birth and aging and disease and death of the body I experience. Because I experience it, it must be something different from me. I am not it. Uh, the ups and downs of the mind. It's, we are often tortured by the mind. The mind is the cause of our greatest suffering. The ups and downs of the mind. The pleasure and the pain, the frustrations and the uh, anxieties and fear in the mind. They are objects of my awareness. I am not them. I am ever free of them. Before they were there, I was there. When they come, they shine in my light. And when they disappear, I am still the same shining light of consciousness. So the Upanishads put it in very poetic language. That shining, everything else shines. By its light, everything is lit up. And that's literally too if true if you look at our own lives. I shining, everything is, sh is lit up by me. By my light is everything lit up. I shining, everything shines after me. That's true of all of us, each of us. That is our inner, what it's called a phenomenological experience. So this great sense of freedom comes, if you think about it. Uh, even the worst of the experiences in the body, even the worst of the experiences in the mind, they are things. Uh, they are not attached to me, the consciousness, no more than when I move my hand through this sunlight. You know, you can see... Uh, the sunlight is not affected, just reveals, shines on my hand. You reflect and you reveal all of these uh, experiences. So an experience, basically, how would you define an experience in Vedanta? See, the thing becomes so elegant. Consciousness illumining an object is experience. Consciousness illumining the mind is an experience of the mind. Consciousness working through the mind illumining the body is a bodily experience. Consciousness through the body and mind is an experience of the world outside. So experience is consciousness plus object that gives experience. This consciousness also is free of change. It illumines all change. I mean, it is, it's easy to work it out that logically this pure subject cannot be a change because every change is testified to or revealed by consciousness. The world changes, the body changes, the mind changes continuously. But they are all revealed by this one light of consciousness, which I am, which is our real nature. So this non-objective, pure subject, this is a very deep insight, uh, which I think is not yet fully grasped in modern thought, in neuroscience or the philosophy of mind. But we have to go further. You know, the subject was consciousness, the ultimate reality. We still are not at the ultimate reality. Non-dual Vedanta means... Consciousness is the only reality after which, uh, other than which there is no second reality. Let to go further. A question is raised now. This, all right, we are, I am, each of us is this uh, pure subject, awareness only, illumining the body and mind. But this awareness, this pure subject, how many of it, how many of those are there? If there are hundreds of people, are there hundreds of pure consciousnesses? Billions of people and animals, um, billions of uh, consciousnesses, or is there one? Here, there is a division of opinion among some ancient philosophies. The non-dual Vedanta insists there is one consciousness. One consciousness shining through all of us. But other philosophies, ancient philosophies in India, for example, the Sankhya, which is pretty close to this in the theory of consciousness to Advaita Vedanta, the Sankhya says each of us has separate consciousnesses. And I will not go into the arguments here why Advaita Vedanta insists that it must be one consciousness, but I'll give you a clue. When you, if you ask this question, why do you think that there is one consciousness, that we are all one consciousness? Uh, why not many consciousnesses? That, that seems to be more reasonable. Advaita Vedanta asks, why would you think there are many consciousnesses? You see, the question is like this. If you ask, why are there many, do you think there are many bodies? Obviously, you can see and you can count and uh, you can see, clearly see there are many, many bodies. Living bodies are many. Are there many minds? That's also very clear. 
uh, each of us when we express our opinions, our knowledge, our understanding, uh, uh, our feelings. Clearly, our minds are different, very, very different. So they are distinct minds, distinct bodies. But consider this pure consciousness, which is not mixed with any object. So this consciousness, which is not a body, not a mind, how would you distinguish one consciousness from another? Every distinction, every distinction is either a distinction in the mind or the body or the external world. So that's a clue. That shows you why Advaita Vedanta thinks there's one consciousness. A good example would be, imagine a huge jar, a clay jar maybe. And inside that there is a lamp, a big lamp shining. And the jar has many little holes. So from outside the jar, it would look like many thin rays of light are coming out from the jar. But if you look inside the jar, there will be one lamp, one flame which is shining. So the Bhagavad Gita, for example, says, uh, consciousness is one and undivided in all beings, but it appears to be divided when shining through many bodies and minds. Again, the implications are tremendous. If we accept we are all one consciousness, then we are all one being actually, not rhetorically, not emotionally, not in a feeling of we should all feel we are all brothers and sisters. No, much deeper than that, Advaita Vedanta claims at the deepest level of our being as consciousness itself, we are actually one. And the results for, uh, uh, for example, ethics, this, is, this notion of oneness of all being, oneness of, oneness of all existence, this is the Advaitic foundation of ethics. I don't want to go into it too much, but uh, you know the whole problem in ethics is that you know the question of why should I be good? What is the grounding for ethics? Ethics seems to be a question of emotion and culture and preference rather than of brute fact. Can you ground, uh, technically speaking, axiology and ontology. Can you ground uh, values in metaphysics? And the feeling was that no, you cannot derive uh, an ought from an is. Advaita Vedanta says you can at the deepest level because we are all one. That's why um, love is, an, uh, is a true outcome. Uh, it follows. Hatred is false because it goes against our deepest oneness. Uh, Ahimsa, non-violence, non-violence is fundamental because we would never want to hurt ourselves truly. Uh, we, would not, we should not want to hurt others, anybody else. Uh, so this Advaita Vedanta, this, this uh, non-dual consciousness, this awareness of one, one consciousness, it can serve as a basis, as a foundation for ethics. Uh, this is also something very new. It's not appreciated at all. Even in the modern study of ethics, this is what is lacking. All right, that's one more benefit. But we are still not uh, at the end of our journey. So Advaita Vedanta is truly radical. It, you know, it starts off by saying we are not the body, not the mind, not an object, but we are the witness consciousness, that we are the witness of body and mind. Then it goes further to, on to say that this witness consciousness, if you appreciate it, it's not an object. It's a, it's a pure subject. Not, it is not uh, um, you know, open to suffering and change and destruction, uh, increase or diminution. Uh, this is an, like a constant sun of awareness. It goes further to say that it is one in all beings, in all the billions of beings who have ever been and will ever be in all living beings. It's one consciousness. But still, it's not non-dual. If you appreciate it, it's just one consciousness versus the entire material universe. So the entire material universe is out there from quarks to quasars, from whales and dolphins to uh, the bacteria and even the COVID virus. All of the, 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 the material world, including our bodies, the organic bodies which we have, all, it's all material. According to Vedanta, in fact, even mind is material. Everything up to consciousness is material. The definition of material in Vedanta is also very precise. Whatever is an object is material. The Sanskrit is jada. Whatever is an object is insentient, an object to your awareness. That must be a material. Even thoughts are objects to us. That must also be material. Um, so we have one consciousness, but billions and endless 
varieties of material uh, objects. So it's not non-dual. It's still, there's a lot of plurality out there. The final step is taken in non-dual Vedanta is that um, the question of what is the relationship between this one consciousness and this vast, varied material universe? What is the relationship? Indian philosophy had different answers. Uh, one answer, I'll give you quickly four answers. One answer was the materialist, reductionist answer of the ancient Indian materialist Charvakas, which is that uh, the material universe, matter is fundamental and consciousness is born of matter, of material processes, which is exactly what uh, neuroscience is at right now. Uh, whatever the advances, even then it's the, the idea is it must be somehow rooted in matter. Notice it's the same 10th man problem. The 10th man must be out there. Consciousness must be brain or uh, it must be language or body or behavior. What else is there? There's among those nine people, we are trying to find the 10th man. Uh, so that is one approach. The first philosophy, this materialist reductionist approach, which is in principle the same today, in spite of our tremendous advances in, in uh, science. The second approach is just the opposite, that consciousness is the producer of matter. Uh, and this is not Advaita, not non-dual Vedanta. This is actually the theistic approach. Every religion in the world which claims God created the universe, whether it's Christianity or Judaism, Islam or the varieties of theism in Hinduism, um, Shaktaism, Shaivism, Vaishnavism, they all claim that there is a conscious entity, all-powerful, omniscient and all of that, uh, which created the material universe. So that's the second option. Consciousness creates matter. The third option is neither creates the other. They are all fun Both of them are fundamental realities. Material universe, consciousness. And they exist eternally and interact with each other. Who says that? The most ancient philosophy of Sankhya in India, which said Prakriti and Purusha, consciousness and matter are two, uh, two entities. It's very logical. That's how we experience the world, right? We experience the world as I, the subject, and everything else is that, is the other. Um, in fact, some theories now being explored seriously. David Chalmers, uh, the philosopher who coined the hard, the term, the hard problem of consciousness, he's the head of the mind-brain consciousness unit here at NYU. So he talks about the possibility. He says that we must consider now the possibility that consciousness is a fundamental reality of the universe, just like time, space, matter, energy, very close to the Sankhyan dualism of consciousness and uh, the material universe being two, which neither produces the other. Both are fundamental realities. The fourth option I'll explore is the Advaitic uh, 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 approach, uh, which is, it says, no, consciousness was not produced by matter. And there are arguments for each of them. Consciousness did not produce matter. Consciousness and matter are not fundamental realities, both and interacting. No, rather matter, the entire material universe is an appearance within consciousness. It appears, take it in three stages. The material universe appears to you, the consciousness. It appears within you, the consciousness. And it cannot be anything distinct from you, the consciousness. So the material universe is an appearance in consciousness, just like a movie appears on a screen without the screen actually producing the characters and the objects in the movie. Or even better, in our dreams, we dream an entire world. There, there is the sky and the earth and there are people, there are actions. And even you are there uh, in the movie, uh, in, in the dream. Uh, as a, You can see yourself there. And all of it is an appearance in your mind, the dreamer's mind, without being a separate entity. Exactly like that. And with there are very solid arguments at every step of the way. Uh, why Advaita Vedanta insists this entire universe must be an appearance in consciousness. Not all that crazy. Uh, just a few months back, I heard Brian Greene uh, presenting his new book, Until the End of Time, uh, at, 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 the, uh, at Harvard University. And he mentioned that, that it's quite possible that we uh, could be a, a simulation in, in a virtual reality or uh, an imagination of a particular kind of brain. Uh, he, he talks about it in his book. He doesn't buy into it, but he says it's not impossible. Uh, it's it's um, It's... Uh, not, there's nothing scientifically impossible about it. So 
if consciousness is the reality in which the material universe arises, then the material universe is not a second rea reality apart from consciousness. Uh, it's not a countably different entity apart from consciousness, just as all the things that we see in the dream are not countably different, are not distinct entities apart from the dreamer's mind. So there, in the dreamer's mind, it's a non-dual reality. Whatever you see in the dream is not the second reality apart from the dreamer's mind, because without the dreamer's mind, none of them would appear. So the dreamer's mind is non-dual with respect to what it dreams about. Consciousness is non-dual with respect to what it experiences, this entire objective universe. Now, now, those of you who have been listening carefully, you might say, wait a minute. You started by saying the seer and the seen, consciousness and its objects are different. The tenth man is something different from the nine. You separated consciousness from everything else. Now you are saying everything else is the same as consciousness. Isn't it contradictory? No. Here is a very subtle point to grasp. It is true that the seer is different from the seen. But you have to ask yourself, is the seen different from the seer? Consciousness is different, distinct from its objects. But are the objects of consciousness distinct from consciousness? What kind of a question is this? You know, a simple thing would be uh, these glasses are distinct from this napkin. And the napkin is distinct from the glasses. They are different from each other. But there's another kind of difference. For example, the waves in the ocean and the water, the waves are distinct. They come and go. The water is apart from the waves in the sense that uh, the water can exist as waves. It can exist without the waves. It can exist as water vapor and what have you. But the waves are not different from the water because they cannot exist without the water. You are distinct from your dreams. All the characters that you see in your dreams, you're distinct from them because you can you can exist without them. You can you exist when you see them, and when they disappear back into you, you still exist. But those characters in the dream, the entire dream world, cannot exist without you. So they do not constitute a second reality apart from you. So the first step in Advaita Vedanta is to appreciate what consciousness really is. What am I as consciousness? And then to see whatever I experience is actually not different from me, the one consciousness. This one consciousness known as Brahman or Atman in Advaita Vedanta is non-dual, Advaita, not two, with regard to the entire universe. So this is a tremendous claim and tremendous insight, not new. This has been pretty well known in India for thousands of years and there have been thousands and thousands of people in every century, in every generation practicing it and deriving benefits from it. So think about it, investigate it. The huge amount of material is available there. Uh, I think it is, for me at least, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And so I love talking about it and sharing it with people. Um, I think there are a lot of questions. Nitin? Yes, uh, yeah. Swamiji, thank you so much for an amazing and eye-opening talk so we can truly see. Uh, we definitely have uh, good questions coming in, so let's get started with those. The first one uh, is the quintess quintessential question for in, in, in Vedanta, of course. Uh, how does consciousness, which is pure subject, evolve into its contents, which is objects? And related is, why does the one consciousness appear as many? Okay, very deep questions. <laughs> And this just shows the person who has listened to this has understood what is being said. So we do come to that question. So how does it evolve into uh, its objects? How does consciousness evolve into, into its objects? If you are saying consciousness is the ultimate reality of the universe, then how does it evolve into the universe? That would be the question. The direct answer is it does not. It's like asking, um, how, do, how does the dreamer's mind evolve into all the people and the buildings and the sky and the earth and the ocean? How does the mind become a world? The answer is it doesn't. By its unique capacity, it only experiences a world projected within itself. The, the entire process of evolution is within creation, within the universe. So given a certain state, it evolves into other states. And that's perfectly all right. Uh, Vedanta is comfortable with evolution. In fact, Monier Williams, who first was a British Indologist who com compiled the first English Sanskrit dictionary, he said these ancient Indians were Darwinists a thousand years before Darwin. 
So an evolution within the living system, even an evolution of the cosmos, that is in principle understood. Of course, today with science, we understand it much, much better. But in principle, Vedanta would have no objection to that. But what Vedanta says, that consciousness did not create, uh, did not become this universe. That is the second theory of consciousness, which I talked about. That's a religious understanding. God produces, God creates this universe. Conscious, uh, Advaita Vedanta says, no, consciousness does not create an universe in that sense. It's still, whenever you are seeing anything, you're still experiencing consciousness itself. It's just this capacity of consciousness to project its own image. Why would it do so? Uh, deep question. In fact, uh, this is the question of why does the one become the many? Why? Uh, how is the question of science? And that's within the many. But why at all would it appear? See, Swami, you are saying why the, the one does not become the many, but it appears as the many. You could still ask, why does it appear as the many? Uh, so this is a very deep question. Why does the one become the many? It's basically the same question as why does anything appear in this universe at all? Uh, I was just reading yesterday, Heidegger, one of the most brilliant philosophers of the 20th century. Uh, he says this question, why does anything at all exist in this universe, is the first question. Why? Because he says it's the widest possible question because it includes everything, consciousness and all its objects. It is the deepest possible question. Because it's not a question of a particular area of science. It's not a physics question, a math question, or a biology question, or a brain science question. It's a deep, it is the deepest question from which everything else emerges. And he says it's the most fundamental question because of this last one. It, when you ask, why does anything exist? Why does the ultimate reality appear as one, appear as many? Remember, this question and the questionnaire are also part of the many. So I am part of this appearance of this universe, and I am also asking about myself. When I ask why all this, in all this, I am there. So this question is asking about its own existence. So Heidegger calls it, this question is the most fundamental question because you're asking why, 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 why? You're asking a question about causality itself. So this question is most fundamental, uh, most the widest question, and the deepest question. Now, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just saying, let us understand how profound it is. And let me give you just two answers, and I'll, I'll get, we'll get on to the other questions. Uh, one answer is, Vedanta says, this question is illogical. Why is this question illogical? Because the question why, you're asking for a cause. Whenever we ask why, we're asking for a cause. Why is the grass wet? Because it rained. Because. So why does the consciousness appear as the many? You're asking for a cause. But in between consciousness and the many, in the many, at the beginning of the many, causation, time, space, causation. It's basically the stage upon which this consciousness, Brahman, plays out its drama of the universe. Moment you ask why, you've already assumed causation. You've already assumed the start of uh, this manifestation. Um, because causation itself is built into creation. I'll just leave it there. But let me give you a, a simpler answer, which I didn't find in the Vedanta text, but it appeared to be the simplest possible answer. You're asking, why does consciousness appear as so many objects? Why? What are the options to consciousness? It could either appear as something or not appear as anything. And that's exactly what consciousness is doing. Um, if you, when you are awake, when you are dreaming, you have this entire waking world, the dream world. But when you're in deep sleep, you have this blankness. Consciousness not appearing as anything. Blankness, the absence of objects is experienced. And in waking and dreaming, the presence of objects is experienced. What else can consciousness do? It can be something or it can be nothing. And it gives you both options. If you look at the macrocosmic universe, the Vedantic idea that the entire universe is projected from consciousness, appears as all of this, and then again disappears, you know, the Srishti, Sriti Pralaya, the projection, the sustenance, and the final dissolution of the universe. So there is a period when consciousness or Brahman appears as the universe, and there is a timeless period, let us say, when it does not appear as the universe. So there are logically two alternatives, and both are uh, provided by Brahman. Brahman consciousness would be like, what are you <laughs> complaining about? Yes. Very nice. Uh, thank you, Swamiji. So next question that we have is uh, 
was asked early on in your lecture. Uh, you explained so far that consciousness is aware of the mind, but you also mentioned that it illuminates the mind, which seems a little different. Could you explain how we know that it illuminates? Right. Illuminates is a better word. The moment you say aware of the mind, we get this general idea of uh, uh, when we are aware of something. I'm aware of the screen and the people and uh, these questions. So already the mind is involved, thinking is going on, it's being processed. It's a process. That's part of the mind. It's not part of consciousness. So consciousness is not aware of the mind in the way the mind is aware of everything else. The mind is thinking about everything else and processing data. Consciousness is not like that. Consciousness is more like a light that uniformly shines on whatever is presented before it, in it, to it, within it. So let us say consciousness shines. Consciousness illumines. The light metaphor is used again and again in Advaita Vedanta. So this is called the self-illuminous nature of consciousness in Sanskrit Swaprakasha. Uh, it reveals itself and whatever is presented to it. So it's not that consciousness is thinking about the mind. Yeah. Awesome. The next question, uh, this was also asked earlier on. Uh, since I am the witness awareness, that means I'm creating my own world and other entities. Is that correct? Uh, witness awareness, is it creating its own world? I as the witness awareness, remember, whenever we are talking about it at this level, uh, we, in most cases, we still do not appreciate what is meant by the witness awareness. We are still thinking of ourselves as a kind of mind. One Vedanta teacher, he put it very beautifully. In all the initial stages, even when we feel we have understood it and people claim they have understood it, I am the witness consciousness, the witness awareness. You have to be careful. What are you smuggling into consciousness? He said, what are you smuggling into Brahman? We are surreptitiously smuggling the body or the mind, especially the mind into consciousness. So it is not that uh, we are creating this universe as we see it, uh, as we go along. Definitely, we are creating the objects in our dreams, but we are not creating the physical objects out there because the moment we say physical objects out there, we are already located in a body and a mind. So from this body-mind perspective, I, Sarva Priyananda, am not creating Manhattan. It's not that kind of uh, what is called subjective idealism. Subjective idealism is the mind creates its objects, uh, like, like Berkeley, Bishop Berkeley, for example, or the ancient Buddhist Vijnanavadis, the mind-only school of uh, of um, Buddhism. Um, Shankaracharya, the great teacher of Advaita, he spends a lot of time and energy distinguishing Vedantic theory of consciousness from the Buddhist mind-only theory. So um, as a preliminary answer, I would say, if you want a straight answer, no. When we talk about, am I creating my objects? No, you are not because already you are thinking of yourself as a body-mind. Uh, this consciousness plus body and mind. The whole purpose in Advaita Vedanta is to put a lot of effort into shifting our paradigm of ourselves as a body with consciousness to a consciousness with a body. That's the first step. And then body and universe will all be seen as appearances in consciousness. Now, just a little qualification for those who are well versed in philosophy and Vedanta. There is the school of uh, Vedanta called Drishti Shrishti Vada, a sub school of Vedanta, which does say, yes. You are the creators of your object. Just as in dreams, you create objects and dream about them. It's This world is also a virtual reality. You are the creators of the matrix of this world. So, uh, so that's, a, that's a school. But there they say you must be firmly established in the witness consciousness idea. And then only you can see that yes, all of these things are appearances in me. And therefore, uh, creator also is very careful. You have to be very careful. Uh, you don't actually create anything. Whatever you think you are creating, they are nothing other than you, the consciousness, appearing distinct from you. Yes. Great. Um, next question is, uh, so I think this is probably going to be a good question to end with. What are the methods for actual realization and entering the state of non-duality? Very good. Um, 
And the question would be, what is the methodology here? What is the practice here, apart from the philosophy? Here, the philosophy is the practice, but there are things to be done. Let me outline that very quickly. Uh, this is called the method of knowledge, as distinguished from the method of faith, the method of uh, service, or method of meditation, the method of knowledge, jnana yoga. In this method or path of knowledge, the actual practices are um, literally hearing, uh, reasoning, and meditating. Shravana, manana, nididhyasana in Sanskrit. Hearing is basically systematically studying this. So we try to uh, understand what is being said here. Try to grasp it. Not a question of believing in it. Try to get it. At this, this stage will be complete. The first stage is complete when I say, all right, I have read the books. I have heard the talks. I know what is being said. Uh, so then the first stage is complete. The second stage is that I know what is being said, but I have many questions about it. I don't get it. The second stage is to work it out. Most of these texts are in the format of questions and answers, just like what we are doing here. And a lot of questions are raised, which are our own questions, and many questions we wouldn't even dream about. Those are raised and answers are given. We have to work through those questions and answers till, till we can say confidently, I get it. You can ask me questions. I can answer your questions. I understand it. I not only know the teaching, but I also understand it. It's clear to me. I'm convinced. I'm sold. Now, what's the problem? It's true that I get it, but, you know, um, it's not a living reality for me. I still kind of feel the same person. We we were promised that you would transcend suffering and uh, uh, attain a deep sense of peace and well-being. I'm not getting that. I still am buffeted by the ups and downs of life. So the third stage is meditation. Meditation, not in the sense of sitting quietly, but what we have studied and what we have understood to dwell in that, to marinate ourselves in that, to assimilate that. So Swami Vivekananda uses the terms assimilation of, of what we have learned, of what we have understood. So you meditate on that till it, there's a moment, a very clear moment of awakening where it seems absolutely obvious and effortlessly so. After that, even if you try, the person who doesn't get it, even by trying, does not seem to uh, feel that you are the witness consciousness. The person who gets it, even without wanting to, even without trying, cannot, will, will get it. And even if it does not want it, cannot escape from it. It's done. You, once you walk through that gate, it's done. Now, there are associated practices. If you do this, we'll find there are problems coming up. The problems are not with the teaching. The problems are with our own mind. So one problem is called scattered mind in Sanskrit, Vikshepa. So a practice of focus, especially in these days uh, uh, of distraction, um, the mind is, uh, is scattered more and more. And it doesn't quite grasp or soak in the teachings. So practice, regular practice of meditation, mindfulness, you might say, is, is taught. In Sanskrit, it is called upasana. It combines both worship and meditation. There's another level of practice that the mind is conditioned by negativities, prejudices, hatreds, and passions, and lusts. And this has to be toned down, cleansed, so to say. It's called, the problem is called impure mind, and the solution is called pure mind. And there are practices for that too. So they are associated practices, which, which basically sharpen the knife, which, which clean the mirror. That's a saying among the monks in the Himalayas. Is your mirror clean? The mirror is the mind. So when they clean the mirror, then these teachings take effect just like that. They are very fast, very direct, very powerful. Wonderful. Perfectly on time. Thank you so much for joining us today, Swamiji, and for your enlightening words and packing so much wonderful content in such a little time. Uh, really, really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, it's been a privilege to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And many thanks to the Google Talk backend team as well for enabling this wonderful platform and for making this a smooth session. And thanks to everyone as well in the audience for joining. If you are interested in learning more about non-duality and consciousness, please look up Swami Sarvapriyananda on YouTube or subscribe to the Vedanta NY channel. He also has an Ask Swami program through which you can ask more questions. Thank you, everybody. Again, have an illumined day. Thank you. Namaste.